Hello and welcome to the last session of the ninth annual faculty research symposium. We have an excellent lineup of oral research presentations and the presenters, as well as the moderators. We will bow our heads in prayer and start the session. Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for seeing us through these two days. Thank you for the success thus far. And I pray for each and every presenter and each and every researcher and moderator that you give them the confidence as we go forward through this program. Thank you for the success. In your son's name I pray, amen. And for the first presentation, it's School of Arts and Sciences. The moderator is Dr. Ramona Hyman. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Ramona Hyman. I am the Assistant Vice President of Faculty Development at Oakwood University. And I am honored, honored to introduce our first two presenters for this afternoon. Their subject, descriptive writing and its connection to the elements of thought in critical thinking. Ponder that as I tell you a little bit about them. Our first co-investigator is Dr. Kayla Ward. Dr. Kayla Faith Gilchrist Ward is a 26-year educator who holds a Bachelor of Arts and a Master of Education from the University of Montevallo in Montevallo, Alabama. A Master of Science in Education from Sanford University in Birmingham and a Doctor of Education from Nova Southeastern University in Florida. Dr. Ward worked in the public school system for 14 years as a teacher, social director, assistant to the administrator, and curriculum developer. She has served as an assistant dean, education consultant, and online instructor for several universities around the country. Dr. Ward currently serves as an associate professor in the Department of English and Foreign Languages at Oakwood University. She also serves as a board member of Sanford University Black Alumni Association, a board member for Fountain of Life Community Development Corporation, and a program reviewer for the National Council of Teachers of English. Dr. Ward is the co-found is the founder of Brendel Reese Consulting Firm, where she has written grants and instituted a youth works employment program, a financial education program for young adults, a summer enrichment program, SOAR, and a What You Must Know webinar series. She has presented at several conferences and is published in the Journal of Adventist Education. In 2007, Dr. Ward published her first ebook for Amazon publishers entitled Play to Win, A Book of Victory, and is writing her second. She is a firm believer that with God, all things are possible. Dr. Ward is a dedicated wife and mother of two sons. She enjoys cake decorating and traveling with her family. Dr. Ward is our first co-investigator. Our second co-investigator is Professor Karen Tucker. Professor Karen Tucker is an assistant professor of English at Oakwood University in the Department of English and Foreign Languages. She has two Master of Education degrees, one in adult education and a second in English education from Alabama A&M University. For 30 plus years, she has taught in the Department of English and Foreign Languages at Oakwood University and has touched the lives of students 
And I would like to personally add Falcati. Yes, during her many years of service, she has edited several books and worked on several committees dealing with freshman composition and general education. She has also served on the Falcati Senate. One of her goals, she says, one of her goals is to help students not only become skilled writers, but quality individuals. I would like to introduce to you the presenters of descriptive writing and its connection to the elements of thought in critical thinking. Ladies. Good afternoon, everyone. Professor Tucker and I would just like to say we count it a privilege to be able to share our research findings with you. And so with that being said, we will get started. As Dr. Hyman said, our title for our paper was Descriptive Writing and its Connection to the Elements of Thought and Critical Thinking. Professor Tucker and I both work with the writing courses extensively. And one of the things we've started to explore in the past few years is how the elements of critical thinking work within our classes. And we've used the argument paper for the most part to explore those elements. But one day she and I were talking and we said, what? we wondered if we could possibly use those elements in other modes of writing. And when we started to discuss the different ones, we realized that maybe descriptive writing could use those elements of thought. And so we're going to share those findings with you here. Our thesis statement was, while many writers may not be able to see how the critical thinking process aids in the transformation from the, vis from the visual image to the written word, critical thinking is a primary element of descriptive writing. And we wanted to look at three elements of thought based on the critical thinking wheel, but we also looked at two standards of critical thinking. So our elements of thought we explored were purpose, deductive and inductive reasoning, and point of view. Our standards we chose to explore were clarity and precision. When we were writing and exploring the descriptive writing and how it relates to purpose, we found that we use the five senses to arrive at purpose. A writer can use the five senses to arrive at purpose. One of the key things that a passage of descriptive writing should do is appeal to all five senses. However, one has to be careful not to rely too heavily on the sense of sight. At one of our sources, the Novel Writing Help website claims that if the writer appeals to the sense of sight only, the writing will lack dimension. So let's give an example. Let us say that the writer of a descriptive essay, which is to describe how his or her favorite place, what his or her favorite place is to relax. The writer's purpose is to paint a vivid picture of that favorite place so the reader can mentally and emotionally identify with the feelings that the writer has when he or she is in that place. So instead of just telling us what they see in the place, they will also describe the smells of the place, um, the things they hear when they're in this place. If there's some type of food attached to that place, what types of food they've eaten, how that food tastes, and how they feel when they're there. When all of those five senses are combined, then the reader is able to get a more vivid picture of the place. And then the purpose has been met because the purpose was to help the reader to just experience the place and not just hear about the place. In order to avoid the pitfall of only using descriptive language that appeals to the sense of sight, we must use our judgment. And when we're judging as the writer how to convey certain meanings to the reader, we have to make sure we've used as much language as we can, much as many adjectives and adverbs as we can to make sure the writer is transformed from the place they are to the place where we want them to be. So it can be said that descriptive writing does involve both the five senses and judgment. 
in order for us to arrive at purpose. We also explored descriptive writing and inductive and deductive reasoning. The elements of critical thinking are used in argumentative writing. However, those same elements are present in descriptive writing. The descriptive writer must identify purpose and use words to describe that purpose to the reader. This can be done through inductive and deductive reasoning. Deductive and inductive reasoning are two additional elements of critical thinking. Deduction moves from idea to observation, while inductive moves from observation to idea. So here's an example of induction. When you write inductively, let's say a person saw a broken window, a, a baseball on the floor, and a child running away with a baseball bat in his hand. The observer, based on what he's seen, may draw the conclusion that one of the children he saw playing baseball broke the window and ran away in order to avoid getting caught. So when we're writing and we're trying to make sure the reader is able to connect with the writing, we can choose deductive or inductive reasoning. We want them to either move from an idea to an observation or from an observation to an idea. Okay, so descriptive writing and point of view. Use point of view to share perception of a person, place, thing, or idea. In descriptive writing, the person, place, thing, or idea is often described through the writer's perspective or point of view. In argumentative writing, one uses his or her critical thinking skills to convince the reader to consider the other side. However, descriptive language is often used in the argument. So here's another example. If someone is presented as being the prettiest or the sexiest by the media, by the media more people tend to agree that this is the case. The challenge one faces when teaching descriptive writing is to show the writer how to use language to encourage other points of view. Instead of saying something is the best, the writer can describe the positive and negative attributes of the thing and let the reader formulate his or her own thoughts and beliefs. Effectively using descriptive words or phrases to appeal to what a person sees or hears can change a person's perspective of a situation. Use descriptive writing or language to evoke critical thinking. According to one of our sources, Heidi Williams, Claudia Burns, and Peggy Daisy, authors are curators of experience. Their task is to choose words to create order and to form memorable pictures for the reader. Based on the word choice of the writer and the background knowledge and assumptions of the reader, the reader will have a different perspective from the writer, but that's okay because that is what we want to happen in descriptive writing. We want the reader to walk away with food for thought. We want them to walk away with other things to consider. So we, as the writer, we wanna make sure we do not limit the points of view by only writing from one point of view. And one way we can do this is by using visual strategies to solve problems. Visual strategies are used to teach descriptive writing. They are also used to help students think critically by using problem solving skills to formulate, express, and share their ideas with their peers by allowing their peers to do the same. According to Cedar Reiner, visuals can be used to show students their process of perception. Students' perception of the world can often make students forget that perception is a process which requires several steps. Descriptive writing helps clarify information and encourages problem solving. Another one of our sources, Mr. Raymond, believes one aspect of problem solving is observation. The observation process uses the five senses to collect and understand data and to interpret meaning. Problem solving is an integral part of the critical thinking process and visualization is a problem solving skill. Descriptive words are needed to create the visual. So descriptive writers are taught to use words to create a picture. 
We've included an example here of perception. We've done these before. You see a picture that has more than one picture inside it. So here, if you look to your right, it looks like there's a rabbit with the ears going toward the left. The rabbit's face is going toward the right. The, the um, rabbit's ears are going toward the left. But if we switch that perception and we look toward the left first, we see the beak of a duck. And then to the right is the, the duck's head. So here we're, ab we're able to see our perceptions differ based on what we see in the picture. And it's based on a person's point of view. I may look at this and I may only see the duck. Someone else may look at this and only see the the um the rabbit. But no matter which one you see, are they both there? Absolutely. Absolutely. So when we're writing descriptively, we want to leave room for interpretation. Okay, now we move to our standards of critical thinking. So with the standards of critical thinking. We, we chose clarity and precision. So we use descriptors to clarify meaning. Based on Richard Paul and Linda Elder, two of uh, writers that we're very familiar with at Oakwood, clarity is a step in the critical thinking process. Descriptive writing helps clarify information and encourages problem solving. Descriptors are used to help clarify what happened, when it happened, and where it happened. Once the details are clarified, the reader can make a more informed decision about his or her thinking. Paul Elder and Paul and Elder further suggest considering the following questions when addressing precision, because we use precision to help us ensure accuracy. When we're trying to present accurate information and precise information, some of the questions we can ask ourselves, could you be more specific? Could you give me more details? Could you be more exact? We will use the who, what, when, and where questions in descriptive writing to aid in this precise thinking. Detailed information is useful information for the critical thinker. When details are ambiguous, it is hard for one to think critically. It is easier to make snap judgments and wrong assumptions when we don't have all of the information we need or when that information is not precise and accurate and when there is no clarity. Once the reader or writer has precise information and has clarity, he or she can share accurate information. For example, here's another example. If the writer writes that a dress was found at the scene of a crime. This is not enough information for one to draw a conclusion about the person who owned the dress. However, if more specific details are included, such as the color of the dress, the size of the dress, the style of the dress, now the reader can start to draw some type of conclusion or inferences about the person who owns the dress. Descriptive writing use critical thinking to analyze the what, when, and where, okay? Descriptive writers can use the how and why of critical thinking to analyze the what, when, and where of descriptive writing. The writing skills coupled with the critical thinking skills produce more effective writing that leads to deeper analysis. Using specific words and phrases help the reader make the connection to prior knowledge by not asking the writer to now, now not only describe the what, when, where, and how, why it happened, but also how it happened. When those are all put together, the what, when, where, why, and how, we can arrive at some type of conclusion. We can use the critical thinking process to lead us to that conclusion. So in our research, we found that there is a correlation between critical thinking and descriptive writing. The elements of critical thinking are used in argumentative writing. However, those same elements are present in descriptive writing. The descriptive writer must identify purpose and use words to describe that purpose to the reader. 
This can be done through inductive and deductive reasoning. Descriptive language is needed to help the reader and writer use their critical thinking skills to move from the abstract to the concrete. And finally, through observation and the use of the five senses, descriptive writers can help readers clarify their thinking with precision and accuracy. Although descriptive writing appeals to the five senses, it should not be ignored as a critical thinking tool through which the writer and the reader can delve beneath the surface to analyze their thought processes. Okay, are there any questions? Thank you so much for your presentation. It was very helpful. We have someone in the chat that has said, this has been a major help and will be useful in my book writing. So, and I agree because as you all were presenting, I said to myself, because I write creatively, how I can use this mode of thinking in my creative process. And with that, I do have another question. And that question is for one of you ladies in that in terms of teaching freshman composition, because I believe this grew out of the freshman composition course, I would like to know, can you give us an anecdote from one of your students who you, you knew grew critically as a result of writing in a very, very, I would say creative way in terms of descriptive writing. So can you give us an anecdote from the class of one of your students, a story? Mrs. Tucker, would you like to take that one? Um, I can't right off the top of my head think of one. Um, an anecdote from, from a student's paper. Um, I think probably in the future, I will have to take note of these particular elements myself in my students' writing so that I can uh, you know, keep track of them. But I can't right off the top of my head uh, give you an answer to that question right now. But in the future, I hope to do so. And one of the things we want to do, uh, because Mrs. Mrs. T Professor Tucker and I work with the writing courses, we're going to come together real soon to discuss uh, possible changes to some of the courses. And one of the things we want to suggest is including a descriptive writing um, as one of the papers so that we can use the critical thinking rubric. Because now what we want to do is move from theory to practice. Yes. You know, right now we're at theory, but we want to move from theory to practice. And so although uh, all of us may not do the descriptive paper per se, we may do other assignments. Like uh, I, I know for my class, we do a visual uh, interpretation of, of a film. And so they watch the film and what causes them to think critically is they have to look at the conflict in the film and make a movie poster representing that conflict. And so by the time they do that, um, they only have a limited amount of words they can use. So we're really relying on them to choose the right graphics to kind of tell that conflict. And it causes them to first understand what that conflict is. And secondly, because it's personalized, if they see a conflict that may not be considered the normal conflict in the story, then what picture did you use to convey that meaning to us? So there is a process that's kind of unseen, but we want to make it more concrete, moving from abstract to concrete, by actually uh, creating an assignment where they use the, we use the critical thinking rubric. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ward. Thank you, Dr. Ward, and thank you, Professor Tucker, for this excellent presentation. Uh, I, I have some more questions, of course, that I have in my mind, but I do not want to go over time um, because, of course, our next presentation uh, is in, uh, well, not even one minute. Uh, so I really want to thank you. I really want to encourage you all to continue. As you, as you know, I would say this to you privately, to continue this research um, and also to publish this research project. 
And so with that, I would like to say to my colleagues, I really appreciate you. I appreciate this intellectual engagement and I appreciate uh, your love, your love for students at Oakwood University. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we have another presentation from the School of Arts and Sciences. And uh, our next uh, presentation, our next presentation is we have two uh, investigators. We have a principal investigator. And then, of course, we have a co-investigator. And this presentation is Seeing Color, The Other Side of the Coin, Dis Discovering God for yourself. Let me repeat that. Seeing color, the other side of the coin, discovering God for yourself. Oh, I'm loving that title. Our principal investigator is Professor Paul Nixon. Professor Paul D. Nixon is a lover of many things. He loves God, a good movie, a thick steak, a fast car, and his hometown New York sports teams, the Yankees, the Giants, and the Knicks. Professor Nixon loves his young family, his wife, Taina, and young son, Theodore. Professor Nixon loves to write, to teach, and to produce. As a product of the Department of English and Foreign Languages, Professor Nixon made it one of his career goals to come back and work in Moran Hall with his mentors and teachers. God has truly blessed him to be able to achieve this goal, not once, but twice before turning 40, he says. Professor Nixon's academic research includes work on using elements of the English classroom to increase racial harmony in our modern society. In addition to his professional work in the classroom, Professor Nixon has also worked extensively as a writer and producer in film, television, and on stage. He is blessed to be able to combine his love for teaching and his love for production in his work at Oakwood University, where he helps to coordinate, produce full-length plays along with his colleagues in the Department of English and Foreign Languages. In 2019, he served as the producer for August Wilson's Fences. In 2020, he worked as the director of Lorraine Hansberry's A Raisin in the Sun before the COVID-19 pandemic ended the production. This year, he revived the production as an audio only performance that is COVID friendly. Finally, Professor Nixon is an entrepreneur. In March of 2018, Professor Nixon founded Virtual VP Inc., an educational consulting firm aimed at providing customized support services for busy teachers and administrators, especially in schools that have limited resources. Virtual VP was founded on the belief that effective teaching requires time and energy and that those burdened with this awesome responsibility are better off spending their time working on teaching rather than the other aspects of running a school. Now, Professor Nixon and his team at Virtual VP use their platform to provide various kinds of support to schools all over the country. And our co-investigator is Professor Claire Nixon, the sister of Professor 
Paul Nixon. Over the last 10 years, Claire has worked for both Oakwood University and Southern Adventist University. In that time, she has witnessed racial tensions that exist between the two universities. Furthermore, since she began working for SAU in 2012, she has been part of several collaborations between English departments from both universities. Thus, she is well acquainted with the cultures, students, and faculty of both universities, as well as the delicate racial history between the campuses. In August 2018, Professor Nixon received CQ Level 1, CQ Level 2, an unconscious bias certification from the Cultural Intelligence Center based in Michigan. And she is currently getting emotional intellig intelligence certification through Harvard. Several years ago, the SAU English department started working on the foundation for critical thinking. Since then, the SAU English department has integrated critical thinking in all of the first year writing courses. Professor Nixon continues to work closely with the foundation and attends one to two critical thinking workshops a year. It is my honor to present Professors Nixon. Let them help us to see color, the other side of the coin, discovering God for yourself. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hyman, for that um, introduction. Um, and we want to go ahead and start our presentation and uh, want to share your screen there. It will not allow me to do that. All right. Let me see if I can do mine. All right, there's mine. Okay. So the other side of the coin, uh, discovering God for yourself. So what we have here is um, a book that um, Professor Nixon and I are uh, working on. It's a book of essays. And our purpose in writing this book is to reimagine God, to present God without any man-made construct at all. Um, in fact, the, the, the concept of God exists in the Bible as a trinity. It's an existing construct. And a lot of times we add our own um, information to that and we end up distorting the image of God sometimes. Um, so in 2020, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic suddenly shut the world down. Uh, we no longer had face-to-face -face contact with schools, with businesses, or even with churches. Uh, we found ourselves with more time to dwell on our own lives and thoughts than we'd ever had before. And we didn't have the same access to church programs or communities to help give us guidance. As a result, several of our friends found themselves grasping for a relationship with God that they depended on the church to cultivate for them, but never really had time to invest in themselves. So we wanted to write a collection of essays that presented unique ways for others to discover God on their own, outside the context of any religion, in hopes that um, that process would help us and others to build strong personal relationships with God. Um, so what we're gonna do here is, um, it's actually a, a construct from the um, Critical Thinking Foundation called The Logic Of, and we'll just kind of think through our process a little bit, and then we'll present uh, one of our, um, we'll kind of summarize one of our essays that's in the book. Um, so our point of view um, for this particular book is first, we acknowledge that we all see through different lenses, and very often those lenses are, uh, if not always, very often they're distorted lenses. Um, we are non-experts, 
that are looking at the Bible, looking at the God of the Bible on his own terms. In other words, we are not trained in theology. And that's kind of part of the point, the fact that we're not trained in theology. Uh, we are both lifetime Seventh-day Adventists. Um, we are seekers. Uh, we know that we do not have all the answers. And we want our questions answered just like our audience wants their questions answered. So because we are coming from a particular point of view, uh, we're, it's important for us to identify our assumptions. Um, so one assumption that we have is that no denomination is flawless. Another is that you can believe in God without a specific religious affiliation. Another is that a personal relationship with God will result in truly spiritual members of religious institutions. So even though you can believe in God without be, having a specific religious affiliation, we believe that relationships with God will strengthen religious institutions. Um, our assumption is that God still uses the Bible to communicate with his people, that people leave the church because they are dissatisfied with the image of God that is presented in the church and or the image of God that Christians present outside of the church. Our assumption is that people don't use the Bible, but they think they use the Bible. So on this point, can I just add a stat really quickly? Um, the Barna Institute has a, a research um, information that they produced. And the, the information says this, 48% of Americans, adult Americans, use the Bible three to four times per year. Mm -hmm. um, they use this stat to support the statement that half of Americans are Bible users. So the idea is that 48% use the Bible three to four times a year, and they call that using the Bible. And our suggestion is that that's not actually using the Bible. That's not really effective Bible use. Three or four times per year does not make you a Bible user. Correct. Um, another assumption we have and identified is church members prioritize their own comfort over relationships, particularly relationships that have turmoil in them. And lastly, that church structures are often poorly designed for meaningful mission. Um, so because uh, we don't spend a lot of time in the book trying to prove any of these because we recognize and we are very explicit with the fact that they are assumptions that we have. Um, so we also have biases though. So um, we, we identify our biases in an effort to avoid misrepresenting or misinterpreting the Bible or the sources that we read in a way that suits our own egocentrism or sociocentrism. So we're trying to be explicit and upfront about this. So one bias that we identified in ourselves, many pastors are more interested in gaining or maintaining power than in helping people who are in need. And notice the important word, it says many pastors, many. not all, mm -hmm. right. but many pastors. <laughs> Another bias is that Christians often overemphasize law keeping and underemphasize relationship building. I want to once again point out the word often because we're not, we're not trying to cast a net over the entire denomination of Christianity. Right. We're right. talking about a lot of people in within the within the faith. Right. Um, and I would say, too, that um, this is connected to many young people leaving the church. The mm -hmm. fact that the law is often over overemphasized and relationship is underemphasized. Um, mm -hmm. Another bias. So traditional churching sometimes does not create or nourish lasting relationships with God. And lastly, that traditional churching is often suited for keeping a particular structure in place. So it's almost like used almost like a business plan to keep the business mm -hmm. running, but mm -hmm. it doesn't keep the people motivated. It doesn't keep the people going. It doesn't energize the people in the business. Right. Um, some of the questions at issue that we try to answer in the book. Uh, here's one. Is there a connection between leaving a particular church body and leaving God? Are those two things connected? Another question we ask, do people reject religion because of how religious people treat other people? Um, another question, why does religious affiliation plummet after age 18, of course, it's based on research, then rise again through the 30s and peak in the 70s and 80s? And finally, is there a, is there a connection between how children, preteens, and teens are introduced to or conditioned for God and religion and their decision to separate from a church body once they leave the home? Some important concepts that we identify. One is irreligion in the United States. And irreligion is indifference or hostility to religion or lack of religious belief. Uh, the percentage of the nuns is growing. So the nuns are a category of people who do not identify with any particular religious um, institution. Um, 
Irreligion is often connected with a naturalist worldview and naturalist being a philosophical idea or belief that only natural laws and forces operate the universe. So na uh, naturalism then does not, um, does not, uh, What's the word I want? It doesn't um, identify or acknowledges good. It doesn't uh, acknowledge God or a supreme mm -hmm. being. It just says only natural laws, and that's it. Another concept is super rational thought. Uh, super rational thoughts are ideas that are not limited to human reasoning. Um, so these ideas are not irrational, but they do mm -hmm. not fit our models of science either. So mm -hmm. super rational thoughts then require a relationship with God because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and super mm -hmm. uh, spiritual things are spiritually discerned. Um, and then lastly, another concept is life with God. So God desires personal, intimate, loving relationships with us. And so then we need to orient ourselves to God in a personal way. So instead of life from God or life for God or life under God or life above God, we need to orient ourselves to life with God. And this concept comes from a book by Sky Jethany, which we'll mention, I think, in just a second. Yeah. Some of the information that we use um, to help us to develop our points. Um, here's some statistics really quickly. Um, some church affiliation numbers. This is from uh, 2018. 43% uh, of United States adults identified as Protestant. And you'll see in parentheses there, 51% identified, identified as Protestant in 2009. So over a nine year period, that number dropped 8%. 20% uh, Catholic, 23% uh, in 2009, 4% atheist, 2% in 2009. So that number doubled in nine years. 5% mm -hmm. were agnostic, 3% in 2009. 17% uh, once again in 2018 identified as nothing in particular. And um, Claire just identified that group as the nuns, mm -hmm. which is kind of our target audience. And that number was 12% in 2009. In fact, the, the group known as the nuns is the largest growing religion in the United States. It's growing faster than any other segment of religion. The, the people that are leaving religion is the fastest growing. Mm -hmm. um, another, some more information that we use is that people are generally curious about what the Bible says and how it applies to life, which we think is a good thing. We also, we also think it's a good thing that people want to know who Jesus is. Mm -hmm. So they're looking for somebody to help them find out, find out that information. Um, some of the books we use to um, help us to sort of provide information and, and think through um, some of these some of these ideas. Um, the, the book with reimagining the way you relate to God by Sky Jethany, like Claire just mentioned. There's a book misreading scripture with Western eyes uh, by E. Randolph Richard and Brandon Brandon J. O'Brien. Very very eye opening about how we tend to read into the text from our perspective, and we're Westerners, and the Bible's written by Easterners mm -hmm. thousands of years ago. So the perspective is totally different. So sometimes we, we misinterpret things based on our lens, which we mentioned earlier. Um, another book does a, sim does a similar thing, misreading scripture with individualist eyes. And then there's a book by um, Dr. John Nixon called Redemption in Genesis. And we, we kind of developed the idea of super rational thought from that book. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. So the way we interpret some of this information, uh, first, church numbers are down. That's just raw facts, just data. Um, Non-church numbers are up, right? The other side of that coin. Um, in general, we, we believe that people are losing faith in God based on this information that we have. Uh, we know that God hasn't changed, but God doesn't change. So because people are losing faith in God, we interpret that to mean that God's representation has grown poorer over time. Mm -hmm. We're doing a worse job of representing God well to people. Um, and then also the naturalist worldview is increasing in prevalence. More people are, are sort of disconnecting God from reality at all. So some implications uh, and consequences of this information. One is that um, our hope is that as people read uh, our book, that uh, a desire for a closer relationship will build in them and will lead to something actionable in their lives, which will then lead to a more authentic relationship with God. And of course, we know that a more authentic relationship with God also shapes how we act in the world and how we act in the world. If it comes from an authentic relationship with God, will then start to strengthen God's reputation in the world. Um, so building a relationship with God, read the Bible, reading the Bible consistently, creating healthy spiritual daily practices for themselves, the readers, and also ourselves, the writers, um, intentionally, strengthen, intentionally strengthening relationship with others will positively impact their immediate environments. Another implication is um, if readers take our book seriously, they may have a clear idea of who God is and have a stronger desire to build a relationship with him. 
Readers will build stronger critical thinking skills and per personal emotional awareness, which will also lead to readers resisting being guided primarily by their emotions and will instead lead more on Christ. So we recognize that we are emotional beings and we think that's important. We think it's important to recognize our emotions, but not to be primarily led by them. And um, I think society encourages us to be led by emotions. And when we try to change our thinking in that way, we have to have something else to lean on. And of course, that would be a more authentic relationship with God, um, which right. will impact our motivation to be obedient to God as well. Right. Um, so that's kind of how we approached the book. So we would kind of want to outline one of our essays very quickly. Um, and the way we outline all the essays, the way we lay them out is there are four um, sections sort of to each essay. First is the concept that we're going to be talking about. Um, second is the modern context of that concept, the way it plays out in our day-to-day -day lives in, um, in the 21st century. Uh, third, we apply the biblical principle on its own terms, very intentionally trying not to read it from a particular perspective, but instead trying to understand it from its own perspective. Um, and then fourth, we give practical steps for application, which um, sometimes is the hardest thing to do. So um, the, the, the um, essay we wanna talk about really very, very quickly is called The Protagonist Problem. All right, so here's the idea. The concept that we're talking about in this essay is the concept of focus and attention, okay? So um, we use the, the literary concept of the protagonist. So in literature, the protagonist of a story is the main character of a story, right? So um, the main character of a story is just the main character. So it's not necessarily a good guy or a bad guy. It's not necessarily the person being innocent or guilty. It's not a rich or per person, poor person. It's just the main character. Sometimes we conflate main character with the hero, and that's not a literary concept. In literature, it's just the main character. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, there's a, there's a show on, no, there was a show on Showtime called uh, Dexter. I don't know if any of you have ever seen it, but um, Dexter is a show about a man named Dexter, and Dexter in the show is a serial killer. All right, so Dexter is the protagonist of the show but he's obviously a bad guy, he's a, he's a serial killer. And what you find is when you're watching the show, you, t you end up um, sort of rooting for Dexter because he's the protagonist, even though he's doing terrible things. Uh, and the idea is we tend to appreciate that which we repeatedly experience, right? So human beings can get used to almost anything, even if it's a terrible thing. And over time, terrible things seem less terrible and even eventually palatable just because we experience them so much. So if you're the protagonist and you're a force of evil, you get used to the evil and you root for the evil because he's the protagonist, which we see in, in Dexter and some, there's some other examples that we give in the book. Um, so the third, the, the, the spiritual concept that we use is um, Romans 12, Versus, so sorry, Romans is your, is your 12, part. 2 says, do not conform yeah. to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Um, 2 Corinthians 10, 5 says, um, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So for, for this particular essay, the spiritual concepts we're focusing on very much deal with your thinking and how your thinking can play out in the world and your actions. Um, and there's a... a a book called The Spiritual Brain, which also has a similar concept. You can change your thinking by what you choose to pay attention to. Similarly, the Critical Thinking Foundation also has a concept where they have a triangle and they say, um, thinking leads to desires, desires lead to thinking, I'm sorry, desires lead to actions, but you can only change your desires and your actions through your thinking. So that same concept is in the Critical Thinking, um, the Critical Thinking Foundation. Um, and then the last thing in this, um, we, we end with these questions. Who is the protagonist of your life? How can you expect to root for God if you aren't spending most of your time with him? All right. Finally, practical steps that we give for application. First is to cultivate stillness and quiet in your life. That is, that, that is to say, make it a point to gather at least a few minutes each day to be still and quiet. Spend those minutes in close personal fellowship with God. Uh, give God your full attention for that time. Be mindful of his presence. Mm -hmm. Silence your cell phone, turn off your TV, go to a place in your home that is quiet. Um, if you don't have a place in your home that is quiet, find a place that is quiet. Maybe walk around the block, maybe maybe go outside. And um, But the idea is to cultivate stillness in order to help you make God the protagonist of your life. Mm -hmm. Another practical step we identify is to seek God first every day and speak aloud what he says is true. And by this, we mean specifically make a list of the positive, positive characteristics that God has placed in you 
and find accompanying Bible verses and spiritual promises that will give you confidence in those characteristics. And actually, sometimes I start my day literally just by saying these things out loud because it orients my brain mm -hmm. to what the Lord has promised he has given me. And that, mm -hmm. that, that makes my day just go very, very differently. So start by posturing your heart before God and focusing your mind on biblical truths so that you take hold of your thoughts and demolish the strongholds that are constantly working in our own brains. Can you give us a couple of examples of some affirmations from the Bible? Um, yes, I can. Give me one moment. This will take me you don't two have to, minutes. You don't, have to, you don't have to look them up. You can just say them off the top of your head. But. Uh, no, I can't do that because there's. I have like okay. a huge list here. So let me okay. give you one. One, oh, simple. I am loved. John 3, 16. Mm. Actually, I've yeah. said that off the top of my head. So, so make it personal. In other words, I am loved. I am empathetic. Romans 12, 12, 15. I am courageous and self-disciplined. 2 Timothy 1, 7. There's a bunch. There's promises like these literally all throughout the Bible. All so over. Mm -hmm. And here's, so, here's where emotional intelligence comes in too, because you have to recognize the characteristics that you have in yourself and say, why did the Lord make me this way? Have mm -hmm. confidence that he made you that way and find biblical principles and texts to back that up. Amen. All right. And the third practical step we, that we give is to reduce your exposure to media, even what we call good media, right? Mm -hmm. So um, don't just take media away, but replace it with something that will help you on your journey, right? So replace media with prayer or with studying the Bible or with spiritually focused journaling. I like the mm -hmm. idea of, of, of getting out in nature, going on a nature walk or, or gardening or, or bird watching or something. We got beautiful birds in my backyard. Sometimes I just sit out the, look out the window and there's cardinals and right blue jays now. and stuff. <laughs> you can hear my birds, there you go. So yeah, so do that Do that very intentionally. Put, don't just turn the TV off. Don't just, don't just okay. eliminate media for a portion of the day, but intentionally replace it with something that's gonna help you on your journey. The and idea that, there is that when you take something mm -hmm. away, it creates a hole in your life. Mm -hmm. And when we try to fill holes on our own, we fill them with the wrong things. <laughs> so right. be intentional about filling them with healthier, more spiritual things, and you'll find more fulfillment and eventually won't even miss the thing that you took away in the first place. All right, and that is our presentation. So we have um, more, there are more um, essays. Those are just, that's just two of them. Um, there are seven mm -hmm. total. And we are um, almost finished with the book. Yeah, you know, I this book needs to be finished like right now. Um, if I can get a word, I think I'm getting some amens here. We have a chat. Someone has asked, how do I get copies of this book for my churches? And how can I have you to present? So if you all want to provide that information for, uh, for pastor, also, we have in the chat um, um, excellent, excellent content. Um, we have in the chat, I see these apples have not fallen far from the tree. <laughs> okay, what tree? What, uh, no. what an, astound, an, an outstanding breakdown of a fascinating topic. And indeed, it is a fascinating topic. And I just want, I had in here, you know, I have to have my intellectual quote note here about, I appreciate you all's analysis. I appreciate your analysis. And I had that you are challenging us to let the Bible speak on its own without our interference. And I, I really appreciate that. And so what I wanted to know from you all, because you know, I'm, I love story is what in your story brought you to this? You want to take that, Paul? <laughs> uh, that's so many things. I mean, you know, when I was, um, when I was, uh, let me think, must have been 22 or 23. And we, we mentioned in the beginning that we're lifetime Seventh-day Adventists. That's only partially true. Um, when I was about, we were raised Seventh-day Adventists. Right. So when I was about 22 or 23, I can't remember the exact year, I went on a church search very intentionally said, I'm not gonna be Seventh-day Adventist for the next six months or so, and I'm gonna go find the right church for me, right? So the way I think of the way I think of religion is religion is a vehicle. It's not a destination, right? The destination is Jesus. So so my question when I was asking myself was, is Seventh-day Adventism the best vehicle for me? Mm -hmm. Now I ended up coming back and I am Seventh-day Adventist and, and, and um, I'm not ashamed to say it, because um, there are some truths about uh, that the Seventh-day Adventist church believes that I just can't let go of. One is the Sabbath, 
One is Jesus Christ, and, and there are some there are some others. So I ended up coming back, but but I can totally understand how a person who's maybe um, not as well versed in the Bible as we are, because we grew up, you know, in a in a in a um, pastor's home, and a lot of our family members are pastors and stuff like that. With Bible reading is just is just part of the thing that we do. There are a lot of people who aren't as well versed who can very easily go off track and say, you know what, I don't like this church. I'm leaving religion. Period. I'm leaving Christianity altogether. A lot of people are doing that, and we just feel like we we might be in a position to help steer that just a little bit and and maybe help people. And we have, like I said, we have questions too. We don't, we don't know all the answers, um, which is important for our presentation. We don't want to come across as experts. Right. You know, we don't, we don't know all the answers. We want to, we want to ask the questions and see if we can find the answers and help people to kind of do that for themselves. So this is kind of a long, this is kind of a long, uh, a long, you know, a long time coming. Um, and it's, it's, it's ended up here. So let's see where it goes. Yeah. We had to live a little bit of life before we could write it. <laughs> right. right. Well, you, you know, I'm looking, I'm looking forward to the right now of the publication of this text. Um, I also have in my notes here um, that you all need to prepare the text in terms of sharing it um, with as an educational tool for schools, mm. I think most, most helpful um, because this push to let the Bible speak is just, it's just so powerful. And then um, someone is resonating with you all um, saying that, um, that Paul, that you were at Oakwood with them. Uh, and so they're proud of how God is using you. And then someone else is saying that they took the same journey. So we're all on this journey together. And I yep. think that you all are speaking to the community of folk across mm -hmm. the world. And I thank you for that. And that yep. in your presentation and from my heart to yours, I wish this book well. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for all the presentations. Excellent, excellent research. We have the next presentation coming up and the moderator for that presentation is Dr. Melissa Richardson. Hello everyone. Hi. All right, welcome to um, the session that we have coming up next and We'll be hearing from two co-investigators from the psychology department, um, Dr. Pamela Cook and Dr. Carmen Buckner. Um, I'll just quickly introduce them and their presentation for us today. So um, Dr. Cook um, is an associate professor in the Department of Psychological Sciences here at Oakwood University. And throughout her career um, in behavioral and healthcare, and higher education, Dr. Cook has researched multiple issues impacting adolescents and emerging adults. Her research spans the topics of treatment, effectiveness, academic success, and adolescent egocentrism. Dr. Cook's current research examines bystander intervention, mentoring, and the role of animation in, in helping behavior. Also, we have Dr. Carmen Buckner, um, and Dr. Carmen Buckner is an associate professor um, at Oakwood, also in the Department of Psychological Sciences. Her doctoral degree is in counseling psychology. She is a researcher and educator with interest in African-American young adult identity and African-American family dynamics. Students in her research classes and on her research team are encouraged to apply to scientific, apply scientific principles to real life academic and social issues with their research studies. Her research students have consistently presented research studies at regional psychological science conferences as she has presented on various topics, including family dynamics, career choice, choosing the right college, self-efficacy, and academic success. So um, the presentation that they're sharing today was actually um, presented also, some of it at least, um, in a poster 
um, in the poster session earlier today if you were there for that. But now we'll love to hear from them on the topic of effect, the effect of and long-term impact of a departmental mentoring program in psychology on graduate school admission. I'm really excited to hear more about this from Drs. Cook and um, Buckner. Thank you, Dr. Richards. <clears throat> well, our purpose is exactly that, to, to essentially step up and uh, bring to attention, increased attention with regards to model strategies that are aimed at increasing recruitment, retention, and eventual uh, placement in graduate school programs for African-American students. So there's a couple of things to think about when we think about you know, these model strategies of mentoring. Um, one is that the research clearly shows that mentoring is effective. Two is that college and universities have found benefit from having mentoring programs with regards to their institutional goals and with regards to individual student learning goals. Um, three is that mentoring is considered effective with regards to increasing diversity in STEM related disciplines uh, with regards to the, to the workforce and pipeline. Um, so with that in mind, what we have seen happen is that the American Psychological Association has now stepped up and looked across numerous years at the issues that it as a discipline or psychology as a discipline also has with regards to recruitment retention of African-American students and with regards to their placement in uh, graduate related programs there. So we know that uh, the American Psychological Association formed a task force uh, quite some time ago, 2006, looking at the issues that existed that have existed for some time, quite honestly, in the recruitment, retention, and training of uh, African-American students. And one of the things that we know is that the problem has been significant with regards to uh, the numbers, the numbers. And I'll just read some of those numbers to you um, as we think about it. Some of the numbers are, in, are, are pretty significant as you think about uh, uh, master's degrees, the, the, essentially the representation of African-American students in um, master's degree programs in psychology and African-American students in PhD programs in psychology. So what we see the numbers, I'll give you just some of those numbers there. In master's degrees programs, 55% of that population is Caucasian, whereas only 12% are African-American or Black. When we look at PhD students, the problem is even greater. We see that 61% of students uh, that are in PhD programs are Caucasian, with only 8% being African American and or Black students. And those are significant with regards to the production of psychologists, and specifically African American and Black psychologists, which we you can tell from that we have a very huge uh, problem that we need to work on uh, and need to address very quickly uh, in, in our discipline. So the APA's task force was essentially looking for and calling for some some unique programming and model strategies uh, to develop. And mentoring was their primary um, objective there, the primary typical model or type of model that they that they were calling upon and thinking that it could have the impact there. So let me give you a, a basic and um, most often cited definition of, of mentoring in the, in, the, in the literature. Mentoring essentially is defined as that relationship between individuals, um, two individuals in which there's a commitment by a, the older, more mature, more experienced individual to provide that developmental support to that less experienced individual, i.e. the student there. So using mentoring, we got to thinking about this model uh, and, and why, you know, why mentoring was because mentoring is believed to be effective with reducing in, uh, the inequities um, for marginalized populations uh, and groups there. Now we thought a little bit broader uh, in terms of the setting. Uh, we know that HBCUs have an, a unique setting a unique environment, a unique offering with regards to implementation 
of, of these model strategies and with re regards to mentoring there. And why is that? Is that because in HBCUs, we have a very much a very focused faculty student interaction and very focused mentorship that is based on teaching, learning and student development there. And we can take that even one step further and we can look at Oakwood and we can say, OK, well, it has all those characteristics that I've just described about an HBCU, but it also then has the, the unique characteristics of being a Christian institution. So we think that is just a wonderful right combination. And the literature supports all of those factors in terms of the need, the problem, you know, the impact upon psychology, the impact upon needing to produce more African-American psychologists and the uniqueness and the contributions that HBCUs can make in um, being a part of establishing these model strategies there. So what we did is that we went to the literature and we started looking for the, the, the literature that really is recommended in terms of conducting research on mentoring. And that would be the Hunt and Michael uh, model. And the Hunt and Michael model comes up and it says essentially this, that there's really some benefits for different groups of individuals with regards to mentoring. And one is that, you know, the protege absolutely uh, benefits, the protege or the student benefits. In addition to that, the mentor benefits, and then finally the profession benefits. So the, the protege benefits certainly from the security, the self-esteem, and then from that just support that we see happening there. The mentor obviously benefits because they are, they, there's some satisfaction. There is some confirmation. Uh, there's some rejuvenation and just a challenge there of being in that position of mentoring a younger uh, developing individual. And then finally, the profession benefits because you are creating one generation after the other that can mentor the, the, and raise up the next generation in that discipline. So we like this model because of those benefits. And so what is this model? What are the constructs of this model that are going to, that we're, that we use to implement into our, our study. And those constructs are this protege characteristics, mentor characteristics and mentor protege, protege relationships. So those are the three constructs that we tried to emphasize in creating our model and conducting the research. So in our department program, we definitely concentrate on a couple of elements. One, we look at that mentor-protege relationship. Two, we have high impact programming uh, that we try to offer at each classification year. And then finally, we have alumni. And we've been at this for a long enough time period that we cre have created from a freshman all the way to an alumni uh, position status, um, this, this model this uh, implementation there. And then, and then the last part of it is that we have a peer mentoring component. So if you break down our classification years, what's going on there? What we're actually doing, and you're going to see across every classification all the way through alumni, we've got extensive communication going on. We are using technology through group messaging to make sure that almost 24 seven, there's some type of communication occurring between mentors and protégés, between peer mentors and protégés, between alumni and mentors, alumni and protégé, et cetera. So we have basically 24 hour communication happening there. So now we try to take our freshmen and we try to start out really strong with them. We set up meetings, required meetings between the mentor and the, and, and the freshman and at required intervals of time. And then we also plug in using PY105, Introductory to Psychology for the Major, where we get the freshmen from the minute they walk in the door and get them started on this track of this mentoring program there. And like I said, we can uh, keep the communication happening. Sophomores, again, we've got that scheduled time period that they meet with their mentors. We then plug them in and accelerate them pretty quickly into statistics. We accelerate them into research experiences. Uh, we allow freshmen and sophomores actually to be members of our research teams there and to play significant roles there. And then finally for a sophomore year, you have, you take, the, the student takes seminar in psychology and that seminar in psychology course has a total focus of introducing the student to the exact steps that they have to take, the production of a graduate school portfolio, the production of a personal statement, 
letters of recommendation, et cetera. We put, we make it very, very practical so that by the time they walk out of seminar, they then are ready to make some decisions, do the paperwork, do the work for admissions into a, a graduate program. And of course, through their years, they refine that process. And so by the time they're juniors and seniors, still having those meetings with mentors, uh, still engaged in even more extensive research experiences, still communicating. And then we hit the alumni stage and the alumni are communicating with us. Alumni are in relationships with individual protégés and, and alumni are shifting into that, that bigger role and responsibility of mentorship there. So now our peer mentoring, we have assignments uh, for our, our older, our, our older students starting the sophomore year, they begin to mentor freshmen and they mentor a year down. So sophomores can mentor freshmen, juniors, freshmen, et cetera. And then it progresses across time, but everybody is assigned a, a, a peer mentor uh, as they progress through the program. And then um, there have required meeting times. And then there's the communication, of course, that continues. All right, the next thing then, as we think about this research project that we have, we have our research question and our hypothesis are, you know, what we want to examine is that we want to examine the impact of this program uh, on it, the, our outcome, our concern about increasing admissions into graduate programs. And then the second thing is that we want to be able to identify the components of the program that and characteristics that we know are going to be contributing to a successful, hopefully a successful outcome. Dr. Buckner. Okay, so <clears throat> to examine those questions and to find out what are the factors that actually lead to a successful um, mentoring model, um, the methods that you see listed there are what were employed and are currently in use. For the sample, it is the current and alum students of the Oakwood uh, University site department starting in about 2012 to, to present time. Um, they are and were recruited using a flyer that was upon IRB approval um, uploaded to our department's uh, Facebook page. Um, it also, recruitment also takes place using snowball recruitment methods where uh, one participant recommends and connects us with another uh, participant who fits the criteria for the study. Uh, currently, there have been 20 students who have completed this uh, survey and uh, recruitment is currently ongoing. Now, this uh, study instrument is a survey that was constructed by the PI and research assistants with review over um, the um, project uh, timeline to um, make sure that um, the questions were uh, accurate, were construct based, um, and uh, relevant. And the questions were based on the Hunt and Michael model that was described um, earlier. And the questions address uh, demographics, they address um, <clears throat> the mentor and protege characteristics individually, as well as the mentor and protege uh, relationship. Um, also the mentor and, I mean, peer mentor and protege relationship. And also finally, the uh, questions address the program's features, such as what they're asked to do. Um, the procedure um, basically is that on the script that the students read on the social media page or by uh, direct invitation is the uh, a description of the study and they receive a QR code where uh, that link leads to the survey uh, based in SurveyMonkey. And the participants there first read the informed consent form a clearer description of the study and they complete the survey uh, at their leisure. Um, there's no incentive at this time for participation. And like I said, data collection is currently underway. The hope for the model in time is to um, subject the data to factor analysis, which is going to allow us to assure concepts that we include in the model have an actual logical fit statistically. Um, the second step there after, <clears throat> before we get to factor analysis, actually the second, I guess the previous step should be that we uh, conduct logistic regression, which allows us to um, find out the factors in terms of their general content, what is going to actually lead to, what actually predicts um, 
the outcome that we're looking for. The current analysis that we're going to report today is mainly descriptive uh, techniques of the mentor, protege, and program characteristics. Um, and all analysis has been um, occurring through the SPSS uh, statistical package software. So as I said, there have been 20 graduates of the psychological sciences program who have completed the survey, and the survey itself has 68 items. The information that we have uh, obtained from just the 20 uh, participants has been very not, um, eye opening and enlightening. Um, we are continuing um, data collection. And so what I'm reporting here is the res um, aggregate responses of 20. Um, the pie charts that you see here reflect the division of response to several questions. Um, I selected these three pie charts because they speak directly to the impact of mentoring on um, institutional outcomes. Most institutions want their students to stay and complete a degree. Uh, most institutions want their majors to persist. And most institutions want their graduates to either go to graduate school and continue in their studies or move right into uh, professional work. And so what we have here is the direct response of the students who either agreed, strongly agreed um, to these three main statements. Um, they have been shortened just to fit on the chart, but the question essentially, did mentoring influence your decision to stay at Oakwood University? And as you can read there, the strongly agree and agree is a full 65% of those students who responded. The um, statement of did mentoring contribute to your decision to stick with psychology as a major, a full 80% also agreed that that's what mentoring did for them. And then in the main chart, uh, pie chart here on the right, mentoring helped me increase my knowledge of graduate school. Um, the uh, percentage of students that <clears throat> agreed here is also a full 80%. There were other, um, descriptive results that were impressive as well. And we um, presented that information with our students uh, present student poster presentation. Um, the next part of our results here reported, report the statistical analysis of some of the variables. Um, correlation was used to find out if there's a relationship between um, the high impact where high impact is defined as, did this program help me to recognize leadership skills? Did this program help me to grow as an academician, as a scholar, as a person? Did this program allow me to grow uh, in my awareness of my abilities and to change in my awareness of myself? And we wanted to know if that impact was related in any way to those forms of support, the group messaging, the meetings once a week or as needed, the connection with a peer mentor, the uh, features of the program where the mentor connected them with speaking opportunities, um, where there was guidance on uh, career choice, where there was time for just uh, emotional support. All of these questions um, were considered program features. And the two uh, high correlations that are reported here what were correlation between high impact, meaning this program led me to grow as a person in general, uh, correlation between high impact and the forms of support that were offered in the program. And the correlation there is 0.724, um, which is considered, uh, which was considered statistically significant. And the second correlation is the um, correlation between high impact and having a peer mentor which rounds out at about 0.65, um, which is all was also st st got the tongue statistically significant. Um, in the correlations uh, being significant, this led to a curiosity about whether or not um, the variables could predict the outcome. Um, although we do not have as large a number uh, of data as we would like to continue with logistic regression and then factor analysis, 
a simple linear regression is warranted given the significant uh, correlations that we see. So in this linear regression, uh, we put the predictive variables listed there. Um, specifically, did you receive or participate in mentoring? Did you have a peer mentor? And did you have previous mentoring experience in high school or academy? As predictors, the outcome uh, was high impact. Um, and these linear regression model retained only, I had a peer mentor uh, to significantly predict high impact. What this suggests is that although participating in mentoring itself, receiving mentoring, and possibly having mentoring in high school could be significant and impactful for this statistical model, having a peer mentor um, related the most significantly and was retained statistically. So what does that mean uh, for us next? Actually, it's encouraging because what we need now is more data to significantly uh, establish which factors are key in our development of a mentoring model. Um, we are still looking to um, test more of those factors. Having a peer mentor is a significant portion of the program, but so are some of the other program features that lead to um, academic preparedness, career preparedness as well. What we see in the types of mentoring support that this program has given to its mentees um, is that high impact is a very important uh, portion uh, in terms of how we measure the outcome. If the student or alum believes that they have grown as a person, they have recognized their abilities, this has led to confidence and this can lead to their willingness to engage in, in challenges and risks that academically could reward them in the future. The types of mentoring support that are significantly related to feelings of growth, leadership, and awareness of change and change in their abilities has been uh, seen in this program, but we're looking to grow the data so that we can see if it has uh, an impact just as strong uh, as having a peer mentor does. And then thirdly, the point here that having a peer mentor is statistically impactful. I want to note that uh, statistically, the adjusted um, um, correlation factor or, uh, is, is 0.42 rounded out. Um, this suggests that um, having a peer mentor itself accounted for more than one third of the impact of the program as it is in this form on a participant. This is pleasantly surprising given that the responses to these single survey, uh, these single questions about peer mentoring were not designed to uh, replace the composite. So it makes, uh, I guess, us a little bit more excited about the potential for the program. Um, students' responses actually reflected, if you looked at the raw data, reflected more ambivalence about the peer mentor relationship. Uh, most respondents were ambivalent. They were not overwhelmingly glowing about their peer mentors' uh, enthusiasm or trustworthiness or empathy. Uh, they were just rather average. And for this um, one factor to be statistically impactful is encouraging to um, allow us to keep peer mentoring as a significant part of the program, but it's also encouraging in that it helps us understand that mentoring itself is going to be uh, something that we continue in the department. Um, so the limitations though of this study must be stated in that we use convenient sampling, which means those who we had access to um, were a part of the study. And this requires a little bit of caution when you generalize the findings to uh, the larger population of students beyond Oakwood. And having a small sample size is going to uh, be something to remain cautious about. It's going to affect the statistical and the effectual results of the data. So we may have uh, results that could be supported um, or maybe showing unmeasured factors, um, though we are rather confident that being based on the model of Hunt and Michael, we are not going to, we're not missing too much of what could be unmeasured. Um, but we're, I think the small sample size is really 
uh, something that we need to be cautious about and we hope to build in the future. Um, possibly there could be significant differences between um, what we find now and what we find in the future. Um, statistically, larger, if larger sample sizes are going to affect the outcome, uh, reducing the variance. And so we may find something that um, a, a enlightens us in the future. It is also a uh, part of research um, cautions in general to recognize that people who complete surveys may actually in some way differ from people who choose not to complete surveys. And this is something that continues to um, be a caution in research literature. So we must be cautious about that, even though we are um, very excited about the results that we see here. Um, the references that are coming through have been um, a part of the buildup of the model being reviewed on a regular basis and also uh, references related to um, some of the analysis that we include. We appreciate your time and attention in um, your, in your presence here in our presentation. Um, the ways of contact are listed here. And we also would like to give special thanks to Alexa uh, Birch, Messiah Stevens and Valencia Bullens for their work on this project, which began in mid 2019 or even earlier as far as um, preparing a report of what's been done in the department. And I hand it back over to you, Dr. Cook. Uh, well, are, are there any questions? And if not, I hand it back I to Dr. I Richardson. I will start with the, I actually do have a question for you guys. And I just wanna thank you for your presentation. Um, mentorship is extremely important. I'm a product of good mentorship um, at Oakwood and other um, sources as well. And I just wanna thank you for the hard work that you're doing and the dedication to um, our students, especially in the psychological department. And so as I was listening to your presentation, I thought about um, what something is also important in biology where I am, which is representation. And um, when it comes to recruitment and retention, um, before the students even get to Oakwood, I wanna consider um, what is the pool that students are being selected or coming from before they even enter Oakwood into the mentorship, peer mentorship or um, faculty student mentorship, and then hopefully go on to graduate school. So I was wondering if you guys had any um, viewpoint or any strategies when it comes to possibly, I saw that you had like a freshman, sophomore, junior, senior setup. Um, is there like a freshman to high school senior um, kind of relationship. Um, also, what is the pool of people that you would look at pre-Oakwood so that you can broaden that pool of potential backgrounds and mindsets of people who come into psychological sciences who can then have an impact on others once they go to graduate school and be professionals yeah. in psychology? I, I think that our pool is vast. Uh, quite honestly, I mean, if you think about the number of, of students that we have come across, you know, the, 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 just during our, you know, our, our contact with high school kids that want to help people, you know, and so psychology always gets the student that wants to help people. And so oftentimes we take that pool and we just, you know, we can through kind of informal assessment and education of that student, help them determine in which, which is the best way for them their abilities, their talents to help people. And so we don't necessarily take every student, you know, that, that says they want to help people when they arrive at Oakwood. Um, we, we want persons to be where God wants them to be, you know, pursuing the path that God has for them. And so um, there are ways through just educating and mentoring. And that's why we start really early. We start the minute that they come and declare psychology as their major and, and we start an introduction of psychology, moving them into understanding what psychology is and the processes affiliated with psychology. And so through that, we're then able to go through a selection process and, and help the students make the decision about is psychology for them or is biology for them, et cetera, there. And so that really starts, I think, the selection starts at the minute they walk in. And I think the pool is vast. Uh, and I think it's something that just through maturity 
and uh, assistance by the professors uh, were able to help the student be in the right place that, you know, and follow the plan that God has for them. Okay. Uh, I, I do think that a lot of students wonder if psychology is a good choice because of its, its relatedness to a number of things that people want to do. You know, you go into business, you need to know how to talk to people. You go into communications, you need to know how to uh, talk to people. You need to know, you know, what kind, what makes a person tick, so to speak. So um, we do spend, Dr. Cook, I should say, spends a lot of time in the uh, introductory psychology class for the major, really letting students know that it's not only about helping people and it's not only about knowing what makes a person tick, but it's also about answering questions about human behavior, about understanding mental processes. And um, by the time the students gets to their second year, which is <clears throat> seminar and psychology year, uh, this is really a, a testing ground for students. And honestly, the, some students choose not to be in the mentoring program because it asks a lot of them and they know that the challenge may not be where they are. And I've also had students decide that they want to do a little bit more thinking and they come and talk with me as the advisor and say, you know, I think I want to change my major too. And we talk about what's best fitting. Um, so it's not that we pull everyone into the mentoring model. Um, and that may be uh, something to consider when it comes to attracting students. We're not asking everyone to think long and hard before they get to college, um, but they do need to entertain just what psychology is going to ask of them in terms of, uh, will they be a clinician? Will they be a researcher? Will they be an educator? Um, will they be a consultant? Will they, you know, think further than just your four years? And you may find that psychology is the vehicle that gets you where you want to go. Um, there was a question also, and I think it may have been answered, how are students attracted to the mentoring yeah. process? And <laughs> I think Dr. Cook may have just addressed that, that in psychology from the very first um, class that they take as a freshman, they get to hear about what this mentoring process is all about. Mm -hmm. um, and they do get to hear from current students in the mentoring model, in the mentoring that, program. That's exactly right. Uh, the, one of the very first, uh, the very first people they meet are, are peer mentors because uh, in, in my class, I have all of the, the, the kids that are in the peer mentoring uh, program. They play various roles. They come and lead worship. Uh, they've taught some of the classes for me. And, and so as, as much involvement that I can give an upperclassman in that introductory class, I do because it's benefiting that, it, that first time freshman or that freshman. And then it's also benefiting the skill set of the, the peer mentors in terms of teaching, in terms of uh, public speaking, uh, et cetera. So it's just very circular in terms of how quickly we pull that freshman in and and, and what role the peer mentors play with that. And then on top of that, the information, just the factual information that they get about the field from us as the professors. Yeah. Well, thank you. This is again, very excellent um, work. And um, there's a lot of comments here in the chat just saying thank you. Thank you uh, for this very uh, useful information and excellent work that you guys um, talked to us so about today. So now we're going to turn it over to um, Dr. Pollard and Dr. Vanderpool um, to wrap up. Hi, so I just want to say I'm really impressed. Um, I've been blown away these past two days seeing such phenomenal research that were done by OU faculty, scholars, and also the students. I mean, Dr. Pollard, I mean, what do you think? I think uh, nine years into the making, I think we, we're I want to manifest intellectual humility as my colleagues who are experienced at this have manifested during this symposium. So I won't say that we have reached it, but we're on our path. And Dr. Vanterpool, you have been with this now for quite some years. You know when you see it 
and um, we, I, I was so excited. I, I had to uh, post that uh, uh, that uh, text in YouTube. Yes. I praise God for what we are seeing. Yes, uh, agreed. And you know, I just want to thank all the attendees for coming. But I do have some acknowledgments um, that I, I cannot let this opportunity pass. So I do want to thank IMPR for getting all of that information out about the symposium. Uh, Mr. Ron Pride, oh, I tip my hat off to you. You do, you do such an amazing job. The music department, um, the Aeolians for providing that amazing music. Uh, Dr. Ferdinand, amazing. Professor Dwayne Cheddar and his media team. And Jonathan, um, thank you so much. And I'd like to thank our moderators, uh, Dr. Theodore Brown, Dr. Lisa James, Dr. George Ashley, Dr. Ramona Hyman, um, and D Dr. Melissa Richardson. Thank you so much. And I, I can't leave without thanking my team, right? The Symposium Planning Committee. And Dr. Prudence Pollard, she's been by my side. <laughs> And Dr. Um, Havovi Patel, thank you so much. But I also want to thank Dr. Martin Hognett, Dr. Lisa James, Dr. Gilbert Odrong, Dr. Julie Moore Foster, Dr. Ramona Hyman, Dr. Lauren, I mean, Mrs. Miss Lauren Foster, Miss, Mrs. Monique Morales Mason, that's my girl right there, and Mrs. Uh, Michelle Ramey. I just wanna thank everybody that have contributed to this and my team has worked so hard. And Dr. Um, Prudence Pollard, I just wanna thank you for that vision um, many years ago when you actually formulated this. You, I remember you gave out a survey to us as faculty as what we wanted to see, what do we want? And you just went ahead and you ran with it and you formed this. And I remember the very first one and we have grown leaps and bounds. And I thank you for that vision, for allowing us to be able to have an outlet. Um, to, you know, we am talking about the faculty to actually present scholarly um, research and the FGGP. Oh, my kudos. That is a phenomenal, phenomenal program. And all OU faculty um, need to get involved in this program. I don't know if you want to say anything um, about the FDGP or anything you would like to add. Uh, uh, let's just say in terms of remarks on this, Dr. Vanderpool, I'm going to come to you because I have to thank you 1000%. Uh, your leadership has been outstanding. I'd also like to thank Dr. Vanderpool, those who came before you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Benson Prigg, our first chair of the Faculty Research Symposium. Mrs. Paulette Johnson, who is now a librarian at Andrews University, who was our second. And now you, Dr. Vanterpool, you have taken us to ever increased in heights. And uh, we thank you for that. I say we, because I'm speaking on behalf of our faculty and our students. As uh, those who are watching and listening may have observed, we are engaging our students more and more into this symposium. We intend to do that even more increasingly. And next year you will hear uh, more about that. But our students, uh, for those of you who don't know about our faculty development grant program, our FDGP, it goes to faculty. We also incentivize faculty for having students on their research projects. So you may have heard them thanking the students who were working with them. And those students are part of their grant application process. Thank you, Mrs. Michelle Ramey and uh, your team, Mrs. Mrs. Mason, for managing the FDGP program in cooperation with Dr. Havovi Patel, our director for research. Thank you to Dr. Ramona Hyman 
for housing the space within which we do the development of our faculty for these presentations and for their papers. And thank you, Dr. Vanterpool, for your leadership of the committee. And I would invite anyone who is inspired to join the committee to notify Dr. Vanterpool immediately uh, so that we can include you in our planning, our review, and how we approach the development of both our students and our faculty to support the research mission and the scholarly engagement mission of our faculty. So again, thank you so much for joining us on this significant occasion. Dr. Vanterpool, I would be remiss if I did not thank uh, Dr. Mabry, Dr. Nehemiah Mabry and Dr. Marisol Norris for their keynote addresses. On the one hand, Dr. Nehemiah Mabry reminded us to ask why why that is how we get to a problem for example he referenced i didn't know i could put milk thus we saw the genesis of the mind of an engineer and particularly the mind of uh, an industrial engineer who is a researcher dr norris reminded us that you can create your path by combining the majors that you're interested in, combining music with psychology to become a music therapist, but also a researcher in the field of music therapy. So thank you very much for those presentations. You represent the products of Oakwood University. Your faculty are thankful for you, and we also seek to stand on your shoulders as we advance Oakwood University. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I would like to close out with prayer. Um, it is our custom. We, we include God in everything that we do. So let's bow our heads to close out the symposium with prayer. Dear Lord, I just thank you once again for providing us with this opportunity to share the wisdom and knowledge that we have gained while at Oakwood University as you share your secrets with us and you share your secrets with our scholarly um, faculty and students. And I pray they may be with everyone that is listening to my voice. Please bless them and guide them and continue on their paths that you have for their lives. Thank you once again for Oakwood University and for leading Oakwood um, to, to bless your children, I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, next year, and um, just stay tuned for announcements on FDGP um, in terms of getting information and getting involved. And please let me know if you're interested in being a part of this team, the planning committee. Thank you, everyone.